The Lord be with you. And, and also with you. Welcome to worship this second Sunday in the season of Advent as Christmas draws closer and closer. Today we're gathered for a service of Holy Communion. We'll be following divine service setting number three in the hymnal. This is also our annual Sunday for presenting the next year's budget and accepting nominations for officers. Two weeks from today, we will vote on that budget, whether to approve or not approve it, and uh, have elections for the officers for the coming term. All that, uh, that meeting will take place after the service this morning, and Bob Sheehan will come up and, and lead us in that meeting. Some announcements. <coughs> says and wreaths that the youth group is, is selling or uh, order taking is today and delivery will be next week. So if you want to order, there are pink half sheet forms in the narthex to order poinsettias and wreaths. The Sunday School is continuing a project <coughs> with Epic International, a group which provides livestock for people in third world countries, helps them to get their economy and their, their personal family economy uh, going. So if you'd like to contribute to that, please see Lori. By next week we're going to... By next week. They're taking donations through next week for that project that our Sunday school is doing. The no. Ladies' Aid of our congregation is having a luncheon this Thursday, uh, December the 8th. That's at Seamus at 1 o'clock. And <clears throat> we'll need to sign up for that. There's a list in the uh, narthex on the clipboard to sign up for the Ladies' Aid Luncheon. And <clears throat> our Advent worship continues. Uh, each Wednesday evening at 6.30, we meet in the chapel for worship. And if you are so inclined to have a pop-up supper beforehand, we meet at 5.30 for that. In our prayers this morning, <clears throat> we have been praying for Sherry Yarmas. Uh, we're now praying for her husband, Stephen Yarmus Sr., uh, who's having heart surgery. Uh, the Yarmuses are the parents-in-law of um, Wanda Alfonso's daughter, Michelle. So we add them uh, to our prayer list. And we are remembering with prayer uh, a member of our respite group, uh, one of the participants, David Henry, um, was quite healthy and seen last time we met, yeah. but uh, unexpectedly he passed away and we pray for his wife, Mary Ellen, and others as they grieve his loss. Let us now stand as we sing hymn 344 on Jordan's Bank of Baptist.
Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave me the my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you. Confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> seek the Lord in his strength, seek his presence continually. Remember the wonders that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. For the earth 
shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And do we have a tone for the song? Not having a canter in the balcony, please sing responsibly with me the portion of Psalm 72. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair 
and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his feet into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee.
prophet Isaiah, you may be seated. Before I begin, do you know why we stand at the end of some of those hymns that have the triangle sign? It's a doxology. It's praise to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Whenever the Trinity is praised in that way, we stand. In the Lutheran service, so there's a hymn, and the name of that hymn is In Adam's Fall. <coughs> All mankind fell. That's the depth of the issue that we personally have with sin. The story of the fall into sin, Genesis chapter 3, it's not just a cautionary tale about how we should resist temptation. It's not just a story in which we feel bad for the characters, bad for Eve that she was tempted and fell, bad for Adam that he was complicit this fall into sin, or bad for both of them that they were cast out of the beautiful garden of Eden. Like almost every story in the Bible, that story is about us and about all humans. Though it wasn't literally our hand that reached out to pick that tempting fruit, and it wasn't literally our mouths that defied God's warning by biting into its deadly flesh, and though it was not personally our foolish attempt to hide from God and then only begrudgingly admit that we put our trust into Satan's lies instead of God's truth. That is our sin right there in the open. Because we have inherited the very same sinful nature that caused them to put their selfish desires between them and God. It goes by different names, could be called original sin, could be called inherited or inherent sin, could even be called concupiscence, a neat word that means we all have an inborn desire to defy warnings from authority, that we all want to be captains of our own ship, masters of our own fate. But whatever you want to call it, we've all got it. Sin is like a pandemic disease. It's all around us, it rips right through us, and unlike COVID-19, there is no vaccine, no effective treatment to stop its infective hold on us. Now I have an illustration of that here, and when I preached this this morning at St. Michael's, normally I check with Lori before I tell something that has to do with our family. After the service, Lori said, you know you got that wrong. So, <laughs> I'm going to get it in, in the right time sequence here. It has to do with Lori, when Lori and I were young parents. We had our first daughter, Dorothy. We lived in a house that had a stove that was a generation or two behind the times. And the oven door had a very poorly ins insulated glass door glass window, and we should have replaced that immediately, but we didn't. And so as our little daughter became a toddler, uh, she came to the point where she not only touched the stove, but pulled herself up on the door of that stove with her hands against that hot, hot window. And we actually had to pull her away because she couldn't figure out how to get her balance and still push away from that stove. Well, we moved. And temporarily, we lived in an apartment that had, again, a stove that was a couple generations behind the times. It was a gas stove. And, uh, I think we had been cooking on it. It was still hot. And now our two-year-old daughter, who had already had this burning incident with the old stove, walked over that stove, touched it, burned herself, and immediately started crying, I touched the stove! I touched the stove! Well, maybe in these days, Child Protective Services would have been called into this situation, but this was a hard lesson that our little daughter learned. She was bound by her own independence. She had the temptation to test the warning, don't touch the stove. And that illustrates the fact that from the moment we are conceived, we're sinners. We come out of the womb as doubters. Oh, you might be older than me, but that 
may not be the truth. We come out self-appointed arbiters of what the truth really should be. So in her desire to control her two-year-old world, it was important for her to reject the rules that had been laid down for her own sake. So doubt and unbelief are really the standard in our relationship with God and with each other. That's not what we want, but that's where we're at. How can that ever change? Well, there has to be something radically new, a new world order that would replace the world order that we're stuck in. That world order is not going to be created from something down here below. We're not going to change ourselves. That's got to come from above, from where God reigns as Lord and Sovereign. God speaks through the prophet Isaiah, and he shows us what the future will hold in this new world order that he will institute. It will come to pass through the lineage of Jesse, somebody the Jewish people knew, Jesse, was the father of the great King David. But it won't come from the line of the great King David. It won't come from any of the failed dynasty that followed him on the throne of Israel. It will be like a lively green branch that just sprouts out of a stump that is long dead, bringing vitality to a long dead tree. This new shoot will come from that royal lineage. But he will come more so from the spirit of the Lord. It will be the spirit of wisdom and understanding. It will be the spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will be powerful. To the wicked, he will even be fearsome. And yet he will bring, he will bring righteousness and equity. He will come to usher in an age that is in many facets just the opposite of what we've become accustomed. Because of the world's traumatic fall into sin, we kind of expect the strong will lord it over the weak. We've come to accept the rich are always going to take advantage of the poor. But not so in this age that is yet to come. We've all been taught about nature and how that works. In this world, there are predators and there are prey. There are parasites and there are hosts or victims of these sites. So we know that wolves and lambs are not going to make good bed bedfellows. Leopards don't offer goats their friendship and their allegiance. Never trust a lion to take care of a young calf. Nature declares to us it is the survival of the fittest. And the weak merely get burned up as fuel for the powerful. But there is another way. And it's the way of the Lord's chosen servant. The servant will enter human history and present another reality. A reality that runs counter to the ways of this world. His reality will be peace between enemies and harmony in a brand new nature for the people of God. So the question is, will it be a reality on this present earth? Or will it speak of a reality that comes only in the heavenly kingdom that descends with Christ in a world that's yet to come? Well, I think we'd have to say it's a little bit of both. Jesus Christ, of course, is the shoot from the stump of his ancestor, Jesse. Jesus comes into this world with the angel chorus singing, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to men of good will. Jesus brings grace and he executes God's justice at his own expense. Jesus comes bringing healing to the sick, sight to the blind, forgiveness to the sinful, and he will transform the lives of those who live in the fear of the Lord. For this powerful Lord from on high comes not with a sword, but with an owl branch putting an end to the warfare between our nature and God's nature. Now, Jesus very well could have come holding a sword. He could have come with the express purpose of slaying all the enemies of the Lord. But 
then the question is, who would remain standing? In a world where all of us have fallen short of the goodness and glory of God. So instead, Jesus comes as a suffering servant. Giving up his own body, his own blood, to be punished for the sins of a world gone haywire. And people of all nations and all tribes will come to him. And he will not cast away the weak. He will embrace them. And he will not punish sinners. He will redeem them. Will open the gates of heaven to sinners, such as those who were predators, will seek out those who were their prey, that now they might rejoice that their enmity is over in this new order. This is a picture of what the new reality of life in Christ is like. In this world, we still for certain live in our transgressions. In this world, we still live. People are either bullies or underdogs. But in the new world, we have freedom from the violence that rules within us and between us. Because in Christ, the peace of the Lord entered human flesh and made good when it had gone totally bad. The Lamb of God was sacrificed on the cross of Calvary to atone for our sins and then to dwell in our hearts. The very moment of our baptisms into Christ, we have had this new way of living that is not ruled by the law of the jungle. We became God's children. We were given a future in this new world. We were called to be agents of his peace on this earth. And yet that original sin never went away. It still works within us. And so we live in this world simultaneously as sinners and saints. When we've been given faith in this new live shoot of Jesus' righteousness that breaks forth out of the deadness of our old human nature. And Jesus is the signal of God's love for all people because he brings grace and truth as the ruler of heaven and earth. Congregation, please stand as we sing the offer. Yes. 
especially for Peter Sirocco and Robin Hall, or the friends of David Henry as they mourned his loss, or Les Brewer Jr. for Henry McIndoo, Adrian Sherman for Lyle Weaver, A.J. McGraw, Karen Mensch, Sue Struckman, for Peter Merrins, for Sherry Yarvis, and her husband Stephen Yarvis Sr., for Roxanne Edmonds, for John Mish, Chris Santa, and Charlie Branch. And give wisdom and skill to all medical professionals who care for them. Lord, in your mercy, in your prayer. Stir up our hearts, O Lord, and make ready the way of your only begotten Son, who comes to us this day. 